Welcome to the Tetrachy Business Revolutionary Podcast. My name is Rob Yates, performance coach, serial entrepreneur, and CEO of Tetrachy. We're going to bring to you episodes where we interview people who we believe are true business revolutionaries, people who've had success and done it their way. In addition to that, we're going to have episodes where my co-founder, Mark Hopkins, and myself bring you actionable how-to-achieve content. In this episode, we are delighted to bring to you Scott Pickin, founder and CEO of Wealth Migrate, on a personal mission to bring investment opportunities previously reserved for the rich and famous to you. Scott's also a published author, amazing public speaker, and a general futurist. I can't wait to share with you what Scott shares with us today. This podcast is brought to you by the Tetricky Business Revolutionary Club. Our free to join, no catches, no commitments, no credit card membership program that brings to you twice a month loads of free content, interviews, early releases of podcasts, strategies, actionable content that you can put into place for yourself, your business, or possibly your team to ensure that when your future arrives, it's one that you've designed and that you are truly happy with. To go and join the Revolutionary Club, it's free of charge. Go and look in the notes below in the description, find the link, click on it, and join today. Now, without further ado, let's step forwards into this session's amazing podcast. Hey guys, and welcome to this podcast, um, and a massive welcome to Scott Pickin, CEO of Wealth Migrate, published author, and passionate South African um, innovator as well, from what I can work out. I first heard of Scott five years ago when I moved to South Africa. Um, I didn't know anybody in South Africa other than my wife. And the first 20 people I met, five of them said, ah, you should connect with this guy, Scott Pickin. And I've always had this rule that if five people say the same thing to me within two weeks, I'm gonna go and do just that. And uh, so I connected with Scott on Facebook, and it's taken me two years, five years actually, to get to the point where I can have a conversation with the guy and, uh, and pick his brains over some questions that uh, I've always wanted to ask. So, um, Scott, thanks for joining us today. Um, well, <laughs> that's, quite a, that's quite an introduction. I, uh, <laughs> it's quite a lot to live up to, but anyway, thank you. It's an honor <laughs> to talk. Um, uh, in trying to get our diaries together, um, I arrogantly told my PA I was going to do this myself and worked with Megan, who's your exec assistant. And um, I was sat in Seattle, you were in Dubai, I then had to go to Dubai and our paths didn't go like this, um, didn't cross. Um, what were you up to in Dubai? Just let us know. Uh, we were invited to speak at Finnovate, so it's... Uh... I don't know how to describe it. Effectively, it's one of the more recognized pitch competitions around the world where innovative technology is, is, is effectively pitched to a room. Uh, you only get seven minutes. And what's fascinating is there's no PowerPoint. So you actually have to physically show your product, um, which is quite tricky. You've literally got seven minutes. You've got to show your product. And uh, yeah, so we were demoing our product. Um, it's the first Finnovate we've... It's actually very difficult to get into. It's the first Finnovate we got invited to present at. So... Uh, my business partner was presenting and I went there for moral support. <laughs> awesome. And uh, did you find any uh, South African politicians or anything hiding out there at the same time? We, we won't... I, I took a black bag to find the Guptas, but anyway. <laughs> now, you may not know this, but we're both part of, of the same WhatsApp group um, around cryptocurrency and stuff like that. And... The other day, you put a voice note on there where you said the impact of blockchain will have a greater impact on the planet um, than the internet has done over the past 20 years. Um, tell me more, because I love to hear more about that, and I know our listeners do. So it's quite interesting. You know, I'm not sure how many people, most people have now heard of uh, Bitcoin, mm. and, and they don't understand that Bitcoin is actually built on blockchain. 
So what's going to change the world is arguably not Bitcoin, but what is going to change the world is blockchain. And, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years ago, I was in first year of university. I'm talking 1995 now at the beginning of the internet. And, you know, I really had no real idea of, of the impact it was going to have in the world. And when I consider the impact it's had on me, my life and my business over the last 22 years, it's been phenomenal, 23 years, whatever it is. And, um, and we're at the same stage now. It's, it's 1995 of the internet for blockchain. Mm. Some people are starting to understand it. Some companies are starting, but in the next two to three years, the Amazons, the Googles, the Ebays, the Facebooks, the Alibabas are, you know, all being created right now. And it's going to happen in the next three or four years. And so my you, point. Do you so, think we're going to have a blockchain bubble of some sort, like we had with the sort of dot com bubble in the late nineties, early two thousands? I guarantee it. Um, there's going to be the half cycle of a dot-com craze, definitely. And there's going to be a dot-com crash, definitely. I mean, I can share some slides with you if you want me to. Do you want to share, see the slide of what's happening with ICOs at the moment? I'd love to see it if you've got it available, yeah. Throughout this podcast, Scott generously shares with us contents from recent webinars, blogs, articles, YouTube clips, and many other resources so that you can get a better understanding of what he's talking about. So please bear with us through some of my oohs and my ahs and some of his enthusiasm as we're both seeing something on a screen that you're not listening to right now. However, if you want to access any and all of that content, we've pieced together a Vimeo video and a series of YouTube clips in the descriptions beneath uh, this podcast so that you can go and find it and access it and see it for yourself. Scott, thank you for being so generous in sharing this extra material with all of our listeners. This is the world of ICOs. If people don't know what an ICO is, effectively, it's, uh, it's uh, like an IPO. It's an initial coin offering. So it's when cryptocurrencies are effectively launched. So you can see in 2014, it just started off. And, you know, you can see the little bubbles growing here on the screen. Hopefully you can see my screen. I can, yeah. So we're up to nearly the end of 2015 now, and we're at $36 million. You can see Ethereum was launched, or Ether, as a lot of people know it now, which is basically the baby brother to Bitcoin. You can see we're going through 2015 now. Not a, not a huge amount happened in 2015. You know, we went from 35 million to you know, 45 million, really. Not, not a huge amount of action. Then we went mm. into 2016, and now it starts to get a bit more exciting. You should be able to see more bubbles coming on the screen. Yeah. Holy what's this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we get up to somewhere when you're at 300 million, actually over 300 million. And now you'll see why the regulators get excited. Yeah. So now we're in 2017. Wow, that's phenomenal. That is amazing. And that's only to the end of uh, November last year, where, you know, the last three months, you know, that would have continued, you know, exponentially again. So to answer your question, why blockchain? In simple terms, you've got e-commerce and you've got social media. The two are being married together and it's effectively creating social commerce. Mm. And social commerce is built on trust and blockchain is the foundation which is going to allow that to happen. So blockchain is distributed trust that is going to allow social commerce to take place. So you and me want to buy or sell anything, it's going to happen based on social commerce and it's going to happen on blockchain. So why is it going to affect all of our lives and all of our businesses? Well, it's going to cut out every single middleman on the planet. Um, there's a great uh, two minute video, which I can share with you if you want me to on, on the impact of blockchain. It's the most simple uh, version I've seen, but if you take a real estate transaction or property transaction, you know, if, if you want to buy my house, there's 16 different middlemen between you and, and buying the mm. house, depending on what country you're in, it takes on average three months and more. And it's very costly, very inefficient and very expensive on blockchain. It takes seven minutes. Mm. Okay, so now the lawyers have lost their business, the estate agents have lost their business, the SCO, everyone, the banks, everyone, they've all gone. Okay, and, um, and so it's going to make a massive, massive dif difference in all our lives. And, um, and, you know, there's a great article that I can share with you that I got two days ago on the, five, on the nine industries that are going to get most materially uh, disrupted by blockchain. And the first one is, is uh, banking and the second one is real estate. Mm. Um, you know, because I know you've got a whole bunch of business owners that listen, I'm sure they're all fascinated what the other seven are. So let's look here quickly. Um, I can share the article with you if you're interested. But uh, yeah, if you can just, uh, we will swap the video and the article URL at the end of the podcast and I'll pop it into the area where everybody can see it and go and have a look for themselves. If that's great okay. job. So it's the healthcare industry, the legal industry, 
the cryptocurrency exchange industry, politics, the startup industry. Oh, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> the video industry and the education industry. So, uh, yeah, I'll, um, I'll share that with you. And, um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about this for, for days. You know, two years ago, uh, we embarked on our, on our blockchain project. And um, I was told uh, two years ago by one of the top six uh, auditing firms in the world that I must stop playing with gimmicky software and that I must stop wasting company resources. So uh, we're still very much in the deceptive phase where people don't understand how big blockchain is going to be. And I just highly recommend you go and check it out because it's going to change your life whether people like it or not. I think it's important that people realize that blockchain really isn't anything new. Um, blockchain's been, been used in different formats as like a series of ledgers, I suppose, for, for very many years. And now it's just becoming accessible to the, to the lay person as opposed to being blocked out by the banking community or whoever else has been using that same technology. Yeah, look, Rob, I would add to that. And I would say, for me, the difference is you had centralized trust. So you had a bank that was centralized trust or you had a deeds office that was centralized trust. Now you've got distributed trust. You don't need a middleman. You don't need a bank. You don't need a, a deeds office. Um, the trust lives in the cloud. It lives on thousands, hundreds of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of computers. And so it's distributed trust, which democratizes access to everything. It's, a, it's, it's fascinating. And certainly as a business owner who, who uh, with Tetraki, we've got offices and registered businesses in several different continents. The, the concept of moving money without boundaries is something that I'm absolutely fascinated by at this point in time. Um, and, and without large chunks of commission being paid, um, I probably... Well, exactly. And, I mean, and with all due respect, you're a wealthy person. You're in the top 1%. What about the, the, you know, the 3 billion unbanked people who actually are the majority of remittances and get charged anywhere from 10 to 30% every time they send their money. It's disgusting. They're the people that need their money more than anyone. And so, you know, cryptocurrencies are going to change this, this space completely. And it's interesting, if we just flip into that, when I was researching around with Wealth Migrate, your business, it seems you've got a real passion about making uh, the uh, opportunity for people who previously couldn't afford to invest to actually have the opportunity to invest in places where previously they wouldn't do. Um, how does that work with wealth, wealth migrate? So let, me, let me give you two real life stories. So the first one is that I did my first programming project when I was six, for those of you who remember Logo and the Little <laughs> yeah. Turtle. And I did my first uh, property project when I was 13. And I pretty much tried to marry my whole life together, uh, you know, technology and property. But what happened to me, I had a love for property uh, and technology. And what happened to me at quite a young age is that my dad, you know, did what we were all taught to do. He went to school, he worked hard, he went to university, he became a chartered accountant, he became a financial director of, of a listed uh, company, one of the biggest companies uh, in Africa. And he retired at uh, 49, he gave his uh, money to the financial industry. And 10 years later, he died. Uh, I was living in London at the time. And, um, you know, when I came home, I found a bank slip lying next to his bed and he had tried to draw 50 Rand, which is less than $5, and been denied by the bank. And uh, basically, unfortunately, uh, died broke. And so I decided that what we taught in school and university is a farce. And I wasn't going to follow that route. And, you know, I went out and I looked and 49% of the world's wealth is held in property. And yet only 12.9% of the world's population has access to property. And I thought to myself, well, this is ridiculous. We've got to solve this. And then what's even more fascinating is of that 12.9%, you and me and everyone listening to this podcast, is that statistically in England, Australia, and America, Less than 1% of us, so you, me, and everyone listening to this podcast, less than 1% of us are going to retire wealthy at the age of 65. Now, that's not in Africa or China or India. That's in England, Australia, and America. Okay. And that is just disgusting. Okay. So everyone is working and doing what they're told. They're investing, they're saving, they're paying their taxes, blah, blah, blah. And 99% of people are failing. The second story was that, you know, I started IPS in 2004 in London, International Property Solutions, and I helped about two and a half thousand people buy houses or apartments in England, Australia, America, and South Africa. And, you know, myself, I bought a number myself, you know, and, uh, and in 2009, we'd had the crash, the global financial crisis, and I was in Bondi Beach, Sydney, and I met a guy called Henny Besaidno, and uh, he's, a, he's a very, very wealthy man, and him and his business partner, Peter Fenstra, were buying medical centers. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, and I'm not telling you this to be arrogant, I'm just telling you this to make a point, you know, I have, a, I have an honors degree, cum laude, in the, in the topic. I have a master's degree from London, cum laude. No one ever told me to buy medical buildings. And, you know, I ask everyone who's listening to this podcast, how many of you own a medical building before I go any further? And, you know, without fail, 
if That's one right. hand out of 200 goes up, you know, I don't know, Rob, have you own a medical board? No. <laughs> okay, so now, so now take the story. So I say to Henny, why medical? And, you know, we're in the middle of 2009. He says, well, think about it. No matter what happens in the economy globally, people need doctors. I'm like, cool, that makes sense. Secondly, doctors never leave their premises. And I'm like, so I think back to when I was a child, you know, my childhood days, and I think, that's true. You know, in my case, the doctors passed on, but the premises are still there. Mm, with a new and, doctor uh, in it. <laughs> you know, and thirdly, doctors are not accountants. So they, they sign very good long-term favorable leases. And um, you know, I sat there with all my property and real estate training and thinking, no one's ever taught me this. This is ridiculous. And it's so common sense. So I said to Andy, well, that's great. I'm in. How do I participate? And he said, no, it's easy. It's only for me and my friends. There's eight slots and it's five million Australian dollars each. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I understand the problem. And uh, anyway, that company today is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. It's worth over 700 million Australian dollars. Mm. And, um, you know, that's just what I call financial exclusion. So rather than complaining about it, I partnered with Henny. Uh, we started Wild Migrate in 2010. It took us four years to figure out the, the, the compliance, quite frankly. And um, in October 2013, we launched the first version of the platform. And Ever since then, every single medical deal that they've invested in, I've invested next to them, mm. uh, sometimes with as little as $100. And so to answer your question, I'm passionate about helping the 99% invest in the same assets as the top 1% using technology, but with far smaller minimums so that everyone can get access. So is that similar to sort of crowdfunding or something like that? Crowdfunding is a swear word in some countries. <laughs> um, and... Uh, so what we do is, is not crowdfunding. Um, it's a, I'll send you an article if you're interested where, where basically in simple terms, what we do is what we call collaborative smart investing. So I highly recommend everyone on this call to go and look up the term collaborative investing. Just Google it. It's been around for decades and centuries, and that's how the wealthy people invest. It's a, it's a philosophy and a way of, of investing. The problem is, is that no one's been able to invest like that unless you had boodles of cash. Because to invest in 10 different projects and put a lot of cash into all the different projects in multiple countries across different asset classes and currencies just took a lot of cash. And forget about whether you had the knowledge, the understanding, the access or anything else. And so what we did is we, we took collaborative investing and we put the smart component in, which is the technology component, so that everyone's got access. And so in some countries, yes, we do use uh, crowdfunding regulation where they forward thinking like England and they allow crowdfunding. In other countries like South Africa, there's no legislation on crowdfunding, same in Australia. So in those environments, we use different regulatory environments to allow people to participate. However, using collaborative smart investing, it pretty much takes the best of the current existing regulation and allows people to participate using technology in a safe and simple way. Cool. Wow. So whether you want to call it fintech, prop tech, crowdfunding, um, or any of the other acronyms that people love to throw at the space, in simple terms, it's helping people invest in good quality projects with good quality partners from small amounts of money using technology. And I mean, so uh, a lot of our listeners are startup uh, entrepreneurs, um, probably have invested their life savings in, in their businesses and their credit card as well, arguably often. Um, and if they wanted to come and invest through your platform, what's that minimum buy-in? I mean, $100, $50, $1,000, what's that sort of? So I know that feeling very well. When I started in 2004, the, the days were different to today, but I racked up over 100,000 pounds worth of credit card debt starting, oh. starting uh, International Property Solutions. So I know the feeling all too well, and I've never understood why people gamble when you can just be an entrepreneur and all you've got to go is to the ATM to see if any money comes out. Um, <laughs> I've been there, I get it. Um, so yes, to answer your question, we, the, the dream is to get it to $1. So that, uh, and that's why the cryptocurrency becomes so important for us because we want to get it down to a dollar per person per investment. Mm. We're at a thousand dollars at the moment. So you can invest in any project from a thousand dollars. And on some projects, we're beta testing a hundred dollars. Awesome. So yeah, that's, that's the threshold we're at at the moment. And look, the beauty is in the past, you had to worry about tax and compliance and bank accounts and structuring and management and maintenance and broken toilets. You don't have to worry about any of that. You literally log in. You do your KYC, which unfortunately, you know, is a, is a, is a horrible thing that we all have to do anywhere in the world. Um, you pretty much uh, fund your wallet and, and you can invest in, in projects in England, Australia, America or South Africa uh, from $1,000. And like I said, some from 100 
Wow, that's phenomenal. And um, so in doing my research, I see that you had Huffington Post listed Wealth Migrate as one of the top um, crowdfunding platforms, <laughs> estate crowdfunding platforms. Sorry, that's where I got the crowdfunding thing from. No, no, you're right. Look, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, four or five years ago, I, I called us a crowdfunding platform. That's what we were doing. Mm. But, you know, we've evolved with both the regulatory environment and the technology environment. And we've evolved into collaborative smart investing now. So crowdfunding was, was part of our, our, our youth, if we want to call it that. Mm. Uh, but it's far more, it's, it's, it's far bigger than crowdfunding. And again, I'm going to send you the link people can read below because people, I get asked all the time, well, is it a REIT, a real estate investment trust? Is it a property fund? Is it a syndicate? Is it direct property? Is it crowdfunding? No, it's none of those. It's collaborative smart investing. And I, I'll, the, if you click on the link below, I'll give you a detailed analysis of why, um, you know, what's different about it. And quite frankly, I call it crowdfunding um, 2.0, as in it's, it's 10 X's you know, the old crowdfunding model. Awesome. But, um, since that article, you've grown across five continents um, by, by the sounds of it. Uh, and I, I think you have customers in over 100 countries now. Is that right? 111. 111 countries, which is, so that's a, a phenomenal achievement in really a very short time period. Um, uh, a, a lot of people are still pleased to have their business surviving in, in that time period, let alone have achieved that. What's been your strategy to achieving that growth? The best advice I could give to anyone listening to this podcast is the way to build a business is solve problems. So anyone living in the emerging world has a problem. You know, if you live in South Africa or China or India or Brazil, your, your most important thing, if you've got any money, is actually wealth preservation. So you want to preserve some of your wealth. You want a plan B. You know, what happens if it all goes wrong in the emerging world? You know, you, you want your money in first world assets with first world income. And, you know, something that helps people sleep at night is peace of mind. And, you know, I feel very strongly about being a global citizen. I, uh, I don't know if I should share this with you, but um, I'm talking to you from Neisner, uh, which is one of the, you know, um, top holiday towns in the country. And, and everyone says you can't do it. And I read a book called The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss about six, seven years ago. And he said, well, everyone works their whole life to, to you know, make enough money to retire to the beach. Why don't you just go live at the beach? And to answer your question, people want solutions. They've got a grave problem at the moment. Financial industry is broken. They want to be in control of their finances. They want to create the freedom for themselves. They want to choose what school their children want to go to or university or what countries they want to live in. And the bottom line is, you know, we, we solved that problem. You know, we, we, you know, real estate has been for centuries, as long as anyone can remember, has been both the way to create and preserve wealth. There's a reason that they are saying he who owns the land is king and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and so all that we did was give people access to, to good opportunities and, and solve their problem and use technology to make it you know, a lot more efficient, safer, and simple. And, um, and again, I'm not being arrogant. I'm just hopefully sharing with people, you know, if you want to start a business because you want to go and blockchain the Karoo, you know, that's a great idea, but you're not solving a massive problem. You know, you've got to solve grand challenges on this planet. And, and if you're solving a problem, there are people who want your solution. Mm. And I like the word you put in there, simple, because really one of the marks of achieving something is taking something that was a problem and reducing it to a a simple process that somebody can engage with that takes the problem away from them. Um, I really like that word, simple. Da, da, Vinci, da Vinci says uh, the, the most, uh, you need to go and Google it, but something like the art of complexity is simplicity. That is, um, my business partner, Mark, will be falling over himself giggling at this point in time. He keeps rabbiting on about that the entire time. Well, I mean, if you think about it, think how complex Uber actually is. <laughs> think, about, think about the logistics of getting a car to pick you up, knowing who you are, where you are, charging you anywhere in the world in the same currency as the car. Like it's actually an incredibly complex thing that they've achieved. And yet it is so simple. Mm. And, uh, you know, for us, we want to we want to basically help people create a personalized path to wealth. Uh, simply and safely. And, and Uber's so simple to the point that I've actually sold my car in Joburg now and I only, my wife has a car, but I Uber everywhere for work and sit in the back and do work as I'm being driven around. Yeah, and it's simple, quick. I, I, I can't remember the last time I rented a car. It doesn't make any no, sense. That's to it. It, the only problem is when you live in Nisner, there is no Uber. <laughs> <laughs> but that brings its own delight, I'm sure. There's also no, no real traffic most of the year. So. <laughs> no, 
I spend more time on the boat than I do in a car. So we don't nice. You've got a boat. What sort of boat do you have? It's a Odyssey offshore with a 250 Yamaha. Nice, nice. Uh, my 2022 goal is to sail around the world with my wife and kid uh, in a in a uh, Beneteau sailing yacht. So that's a. I'm fascinated. But every time I come to Neisner, I look at that that harbour there and go, oh. Well, next time you come, you must give us a shot. Uh, you know, a Neisner on the water is 50% better than Neisner on the land. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. So we, um, you often talk about that. You, you several times in this podcast, you've spoken about solving the biggest challenges on the planet. What do you believe those top three are? And, and how do you believe people can start preparing themselves to overcome those challenges for themselves? Because I mean, the world's Elon Musk is talking about uh, what seven million less jobs by 2025. Um, there's there's massive things that are coming that people really are just. I don't know, I'm experienced people with their head in the sand a lot of the time. How can they prepare themselves for those challenges and what are they? So I'll share with you another slide that I shared last night uh, when I had the privilege of going to Singularity University and this slide was shared with me, which was the amount of jobs that are mm-hmm. going to get lost in, uh, based on automation and artificial intelligence. And I actually found this quite shocking because I don't know why I considered it, but I thought that the first world would be more affected by artificial intelligence and stuff in the emerging world, but actually the emerging world is the one that gets nailed even worse. So uh, yeah, to answer your question, I, um, I consider the global UN goals as a pretty good job. There's 17 of them. I don't, mm. I don't think any one is better or worse than the other. I really think it's what's your passion. You know, in my case, I saw money tear apart a family. Um, you know, it's, it's just unacceptable, you know, and I made a promise to myself that it would never, that would never happen to me or anyone close to me. Um, so obviously I've got a deep passion in that space. You know, others, you know, want to save the ocean. Others want to look after the environment. I don't, I don't believe any, anyone is better or worse than, uh, than, than, than each other. I do believe that, uh, as Margaret Mead said, you know, to solve one of the greatest challenges, you know, all you need is a small amount of committed people, you know, and it's a great quote as well, you know, and, uh, so, you know, find, find something you're passionate about and go and solve it. And, uh, but you've got to be passionate about it. You know, this is not a, a quick buck or you, you, you're trying to make money, et cetera. It's got to be something you're deeply passionate and purposeful about. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's ones that for me are interesting, you know, to the, to the point where, you know, Elon Musk wants to put someone on Mars because he's worried that, you know, aliens are going to attack. David Orban last night was talking about how a meteor is on its way already and, you know, the dinosaurs got taken out. So, I don't know. Different things keep different people awake at night. But uh, for me, living in Africa, you know, I sit here, not arrogant saying this, but I sit here in a, in a beautiful house with a beautiful view. But when I look up on the hill, uh, it's got a squatter camp on top of the hill and it's unacceptable. You know, I, I think we can solve the mm. problem in our lifetime. And so it's something I'm deeply passionate about uh, in that space. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I think there's great challenges out there and uh, people must just find problems that they would like to see solved and then solve them. And so there's, there's challenges or for instance, like the level of employment decreasing, there's those things that are coming in the foreseeable future for us. Um, like the slide you just showed me, I saw, I think that was, was it 48% of, of loss of jobs in South Africa in, uh, on that slide? 65%. Is 65%. Um, Eight, 80% in China. What, what, what do you think that, uh, I mean, is, is that simply the answer for people? Uh, like recognize the fact that jobs will be at risk um, and start sol- start becoming a problem solver so that you still can have purpose and employment when that reality does arrive? So I'll answer that way in, in I'll answer that question in three, three separate ways. Firstly, everything in life is mindset. So leaders focus 95% of their energy on the solution and 5% on the problem. The majority of the world focuses 95% of their time on the problem. That's the first thing I'd give you. The second thing is we can learn from history. You know, when the Industrial Revolution came along, all the people were up in arms, all the farmers, and said, well, the moment we have factories and automation and all that, we're all going to lose our jobs. And they were right. They did. Okay. But is society better off today? Like 100, 150 years later, there's far higher levels of education, far higher levels of wealth. There's the middle class, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, don't be scared of technology. It's, it's coming whether you like it or not. You know, if you're an Oxwagon maker, cars are coming. <laughs> like, stop, stop, stop crying about the fact. It's a fact. It's happening. I, I guarantee it. So, you know, that's the second thing. It's learn from history. It's, it's coming whether you like it or not. 
And the second thing, sorry, the third thing for me is that, you know, I believe that um, when technology turns up, there's, there's not people in the middle. There's either winners or losers. Okay. And, um, and you can either learn to survive or you can learn to thrive. And the difference between the, between the winners and the losers is that the winners have spent the time and the initiative to learn. So they've got the right mindset. They've learned. They're engaging. They're on podcasts like this and many others. And, um, and they, 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 they're learning and listening about where the future's going. And they're implementing and they're testing and they're practicing. And those that are going to survive and die um, will be the people that, you know, like, the, like uh, dude, uh, it blows my mind like when I'm in London. And you see those black taxi drivers and I go to a hotel and there's like 10 of them in those, in those traditional English black cabs all sitting outside a hotel, like literally waiting for someone to leave the hotel so they can get a lift. And I'm like, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. It's so unproductive. I then been in one recently and the guy didn't have a GPS and he got lost. And he's like, oh, but I did the fancy training course and I know every road in London. I'm like, who, the, who cares? Like, literally, do you want me to Google the road and I'll tell you where to go? Like, it's irrelevant. Like, your knowledge is irrelevant. Like, it, it adds zero value to me or anyone. Like, I can, I can I'm, I'm not from London and I can tell you how to get there faster than you can. <laughs> so my point being is that, you know, t- technology is coming and, you know, I, I cannot understand when taxi drivers haven't signed up to Uber. It's just, it's illogical, you know. And then they go and fight it, you know, like they've done in South Africa and France and London. You know, when the black taxis protested against Uber, Uber got all that attention for free. Mm-hmm. Why do you think everyone around the world knows about Uber? Because of all the protests. They got free advertising. And then more and more people used Uber. And then they were like, oh, this is so much better than the current way. And then, it, it, so you, you can't fight it. You, you literally, you can't fight. Like, and so, uh, yeah, I get very passionate. Sorry, I'm going, I'm going too deep here. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the bottom line is you've got, to, you've got to learn. And you've got to hang around people that are doing it. You know, I... I um, I go out of my way to put myself in environments where I'm the stupid, du- stupidest, dumbest, poorest person in the room uh, so that I can consistently be learning. Mm. And it's interesting that uh, uh, often people choose to learn, but sometimes choose to learn, I won't say in the wrong places, but they, um, they, they focus their attention where they get told to put their attention as opposed to necessarily where they need to put their attention. Um, and it's uh, different places in the world have different mentalities. Um, uh, South Africa, there's a lot of people going to universities to go and learn at this point in time, but not necessarily coming out with the best information. Um, it, it's, it's sort of a, a funny dichotomy globally as I travel around at this point in time of who's learning what they need to learn and who's learning what they want to learn. And there's sort of a big difference be, be, between that. Um, oh, you. So who's learning what they need to learn, who's learning what they want to learn, and who's learning what they have to learn? Well, <laughs> and they have to learn. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and I agree with you on university. You know, my son's six years old and will he go to university or not? It's a debate that we have regularly. So, you know, I think going to university now is a complete waste of time um, for the theory side of it. However, the four years I had at UCT were some of the best years of my life and it shaped me as a human being. Now, how do I get that human experience? Because I, I want him to have that human experience. But the knowledge, you know, you can get far quicker, far more efficient. I mean, four years ago, no one knew what blockchain was. You know, there's... There's not a professor in the world that, you know, understood blockchain. So, you know, how could you learn from people that are reactive? It's happening too quickly. Um, so, yeah. Uh, they, and, and, you know, the one thing I would like to say is, that, you know, I, I was very privileged. My uncle taught me this when I was, you know, late teenager or early 20s. I can't remember. But he literally said the one-eyed man can lead the blind. And what I tend to find is that people have analysis paralysis. They're like, oh, well, I don't know anything about blockchain. I don't know anything about cryptocurrency. So, you know, I'm not going to do anything until I know everything about it. Well, firstly, you're kidding yourself because you can't know any, everything. Like, it changes so quickly. There's not a person on the planet that knows everything. And if they tell you they do, they're lying. And, um, and the second thing is that the one-eyed man can lead the blind. Like, you can literally um, know a little bit and get started. And, you know, yeah. So, my attitude is you're never going to learn to swim by reading a book. You've got to jump in the pool. I 100% agree. I often say... Um, uh, knowledge is worthless until it's actioned. Um, it's just it's just something in your head otherwise, um, which is which is a nice to have, but it doesn't really mean that you know it. You don't know it till you do it. And as most business owners and people listening to this podcast will know, the difference between what we all learnt at university, school, some class, some course, some something else, the difference between that and when you go and put it into practice in your job is often poles apart. So um, learning through doing is is fantastic. 
Um, no, look, I mean, I mean, from our side, sorry, a little bit of a personal punt there, but I, what you just said, I love those words, learning while doing. You know, again, in the past, you used to go on a course, you used to find a mentor, you used to read a book or whatever to before you even bought a house. You know, now I say that's absolute rubbish. Why don't you learn while doing? My son's six years old. He invests on our platform. Now, quite frankly, he has no idea what's going on. But I guarantee you, by the time he's 18, he'll be streets ahead of the majority of people because he's learning while doing. You know, my brother's a doctor and he, he now knows the difference between a medical building and a multifamily and an industrial warehouse. Why? Because he owns all three of them and, and he learns while doing. Mm. Mm. It's what interesting. Mark and I, my business partner, we've been doing with our cryptocurrency is um, we've bought some and we've been, uh, we've been playing. Um, and uh, uh, playing, I suppose, failing, uh, losing recently. It's not been so good since Christmas. Um, but, but also playing with how are the people really making money in terms of like exchanges and um, those other places where you're paying an exchange a percentage or a commission to go and do a transaction. Um, where, where are people really, uh, I often think in business about becoming the person who sells the spades at the gold, gold mine as opposed to being the gold miner themselves. And with, with cryptocurrency, we've been fascinated about, well, where are, where, where are the spades and shovels that we can trade and sell as opposed to going and playing the risk game the entire time? You know, look, and I think, I mean, you know, Rob, I know you listened to the voice note because you referred to it earlier. I said it earlier, like it's going to crash. So stop worrying about it. It's going to happen. And, and then you need, you need to take long-term investments. You need to focus on companies where they established, where they're solving a grand problem. And you need to take, quite frankly, in my opinion, a 10 to 20 year view. You know, imagine yourself back in 95 and try and find the Ebays, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Alibabas, you know, because what happens actually is a crash is a good thing. It gets rid of all the crap. And, and that's where the real value is created. And, um, it's going to happen in the space. And, you know, I, I feel very, very strongly that, uh, that, you know, they say something like 90% of the cryptocurrencies will go bankrupt. You know, it's, it's obvious. I mean, you've got people running companies that have never run companies in their life. I don't care how much money you've got. If you haven't run a company, you don't know how to make $1. Like, you know, if you never build a team, like this stuff's not stuff you read in a book. It's the reason that you and Mark have a business because people need help and they need coaching. And, um, you know, and, and it's no different. The fundamentals of business don't change in the crypto world. And I believe that people need to take, you know, um, long-term investment approach and say, right, you know, and like you say, look for, this, look for the guys that are selling spades, but go even deeper than that. Look for, you know, look, look, you know go, go to the places in the world where there are actually diamonds as well or gold, mm. you know, where there are resources. Because some guys are selling spades in Cape Town at the waterfront and that doesn't help. <laughs> Yeah. Although if they sold water at the waterfront right now, they'd be on to an absolute winner. Fair enough. Um, so, so tell me, um, like me, you're a father, you're a husband, you're a business person, an entrepreneur. You travel, from what I can see on Facebook, a fair amount. Um, and, and that's quite a juggle. Um, and I know that some of our listeners do the same. What habits or things do you put in place to keep your life in balance um, do you have any, any thoughts? Do you just freestyle it? What's the, what's the strategy? Sure. So I, I should be the last person in the world to talk about balance. And if you had my wife here, <laughs> you'd hear a very different angle to this. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, look, I'm not, I'm not the best in the world at this. Um, I'm passionate about what I do and I try and, I try and spend time with uh, Kelly and my wife and my son, John T and you know, the business and everything. And actually at the moment, Scott's losing, if that makes sense. Mm. You know, I don't get enough time for myself. Um, but a couple of the tricks I've learned over the years. Um, one is that we do family time. So when I'm home, I block out from five until eight, uh, Monday to Wednesday, because we've got, you know, we've got teams on five continents. Like there's always a reason to have a meeting. Um, so I block out Monday to Wednesday, I block out five till eight so that I take my son on the boat or whatever. We do family time. And then if I've got meetings, then I do meetings from eight o'clock onwards uh, when he's sleeping and whatever. Uh, Thursday night I do date night, uh, so tonight's date night, uh, and I don't work Friday evening after 5 p.m. So th those are very strict guidelines that I put in place, and, and I lose my shit completely if people break the rules, um, because you need them in place. And like I said, there's always a reason to have another meeting. Okay, so that's what I try and do to create boundaries. Uh, the other thing I learned was from a guy called Keith Cunningham, who I'd highly recommend people go and look up. And um, Keith, Keith taught me years ago, he said, balance is rubbish. Okay, there's no such thing as balance. Okay, he says what entrepreneurs need to do, maybe, maybe if you're an employee and you're a nine to fiver, there is such a thing as balance. When you're, when you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't exist. 
And so um, what he said to do is, is run your life in sprints. So what he does is work really hard for two months and then take one month off. Work really hard for two months and then take one month off. So I try and do that. I'm you know, not as successful as I should. But I take like a month off over Christmas. Um, I take two weeks off in, in April. I take two weeks off in, uh, in, in August. And I try and pencil those in right up front. Um, you know, and I generally don't let too much mess with that, if that makes sense. Mm. And um, so, yeah, th that's trying to do the big rocks. The other thing that uh, which would, I, I had the privilege of being invited to Necker Island. And there were 20, 25 entrepreneurs there. Um, and I mean, Richard Branson was incredible, but the other 25 were equally as impressive. And um, we, we shared what they call life hacks. And it was really interesting that what I didn't, what I found amazing, and I mean, you're a coach yourself. Most people have coaches. Anyone listening to this podcast has a coach because they're working with you. Um, they've got gym coaches, they've got everyone. But very few people have a relationship coach. And, um, you, know, you know, my wife and I are no different to any other couple. We have our problems, we have our upsides, we have our downsides. And, um, you know, we've been, we've been together 10 years now and we've, we've got a relationship coach and at least once a month we go and see our coach. In fact, tomorrow morning's the day we do it. So again, it's a big rock that we put in before anything else. And I find that's very valuable for us, you know, um, helps us both grow and equally if we've got frustrations or whatever. And I had a, I had a lot of people on Neg Island say, wow, I've never thought of that. And, you know, like, you know, you, you're dealing with some of the, the most productive producing a type personalities in the world. And so, you know, I, I highly recommend that, you know, you've got coaches for everything else. Why don't you have a coach for your relationship? Um, and then the last thing I would say is that particularly if you've got young children, I bought a robot um, and I can share my robot with you quickly uh, while we're talking here. Um, so, you know, when, when your son is three or four or five, you know, you try phone home every day as a dad and you try to do what's right. But the problem is, is that that's, it doesn't really work, you know, and they're not really engaged. And so, you know, and I went to A360 uh, about uh, two years ago and oh, it switched off, unfortunately. And um, I, uh, sorry, I'll, my wife's just come in. I'll ask her to switch it on. I'll share it with you just now. But yeah, the, the robot, uh, the robot's very, very valuable because it engages with them, you know, so you're not talking to them, engaging with them and you, and I actually think we're achieving three purposes, you know, he gets to talk to me and engage with me. Um, he also learns about technology. So, you know, um, you know, it's a real life robot that we play with. Uh, and daddy gets to have fun with a gadget, which so everyone's winning. A360. So A360 is Peter Diamante is this entrepreneur uh, thing that he does once a year in January where you learn about the latest exponential technologies. Uh, it's, in La it's in Los Angeles in January. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I suppose I could go on for a while. But like I said to you, I'm, I'm not the best in the world, so you know, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust myself too much. <laughs> it's it's interesting because um, we've I, I've done a lot of coaching with people who've been uh, pushed to grow their business and pour everything into their business, and it's come at a cost of the rest of their life, um, and uh, and then that's come at a cost of their business ultimately because now they're having to fund two properties. Uh, one for their now ex-wife and one for themselves. And I'm, I'm a real passionate believer about people keeping the whole of their life going at, as a one, as opposed, to, um, uh, as opposed to pushing one at the sacrifice of another. Yeah, Rob, I'll add, I'll add to that. And there's one thing that I learned quite early, you know, when I first started RPS, you know, I remember taking calls. I actually closed the deal on the 24th of December and I thought I was like really clever and you know, you, you think that you should be available to your clients all, you know, all the time. And, you know, you know, it's all about revenue and profit and whatever. And it's actually rubbish. You know, someone, I don't know when I learned it or who I learned it from, but they said, if you respect yourself, others will respect you. And, um, you know, so if a client calls me at 10 o'clock at night, there's absolutely no way I'm answering it. And I don't care if it's the Queen of England, you know. So, um, you know, my point being is that, you know, respect yourself and, and, and the rest will follow and, and believe in yourself. You know, you're going to be successful. So, so uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just a, in the beginning, I didn't make that, you know, I didn't do that myself. And that really breaks with your boundaries. And, you know, if you really want to annoy your wife, take a phone call during, that, you know, date night. <laughs> That's true. Cool. So as we come towards the end of our time together, I've got a few questions that we ask. Um, uh, we ask all the people that we've interviewed. And um, uh, so you're ready for like the quick fire round. Just before you do, I managed to get my robot working. So this is our bedroom and I'm not going to bore you with it, but uh, you can see my little dog there and you can basically drive it around and 
Peter Diamante has like 16 of these things so that he can, he doesn't have to fly anymore to meetings. So you can literally turn up, you've got 360, you can hear everything. So you're actually looking at my bedroom, you know, my, my study there. If I go, yeah. <laughs> That's genius. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I'll switch it off. But uh, I just, my point is play with gadgets. That's how you can engage with your family sometimes when you can't be there. I love it. I love it. That's brilliant. I'm going to go and look into that. Um, cool. Right. Quick fire round. So, uh, what's the most revolutionary thing you've ever done? Sure. <laughs> I'd always give you the context of what does the word revolutionary mean without being difficult. But, uh, yeah. Well, what, what do you mean by revolutionary? Uh, so, re revolutionary is... Um, fight to fight on behalf of um, uh, people who maybe can't fight for themselves, or, or maybe on the other side of the coin, they choose to go and do things differently to what the rest of the world says. Okay, uh, it's wealth migrate. It's, it's uh, not listening to the current regulations or rules. Uh, just because the rules are there doesn't mean they're right. And ultimately doing what it takes to help the 99% be able to invest in a safe and simple way, and not listening to what everyone t tells us should be done, because the should be done is what the banks, the regulators and the governments want you to do. It's not necessarily the right thing for you. Cool. I love it. I love it. And, um, okay, next one. What's the one question you wish people asked you? Sure. Um, <laughs> I saved the best till last. How can I add value? The greatest lesson cool. I can give to people is that if you want something from someone, figure out how to add value to them. So, uh, you know, everyone always wants stuff, but they, they don't figure out that they should ask, how can I add value first? Fantastic. Um, I love it. I love it. And, um, okay, so next, how would you want people to describe you in 50 years' time? My mission statement is um, I create a world of wealth, health, and happiness by having lots of fun, inspiring growth and change. So, yeah, uh, something that lives up to that, but uh, hopefully someone that made a difference in people's lives. Perfect, perfect. And uh, so you're a dad. Um, so this question is really relevant to you. Uh, if if your child or a loved one asked you for one important lesson that they could that would serve them well for their future, what would you tell them? Believe in yourself. Whatever you put to your mind to, you can achieve. And uh, people, you know, dream big. People become what they dream. So it's all about belief. Believe in yourself. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, um, Scott, thanks for your time today. I know that uh, it's, it's valuable to you, but if the audience wants to engage with you or Wealth Migrate, your book, anything like that, where's the best place for them to come and find you? Um, yeah, so the best place is my website is scottpickin.com. And um, if they want to, you know, there's not a lot of pickens out there, so chicken with a, you know, chicken with a pea. And... Uh, and yeah, I mean, my book, Property Going Global, can help people invest globally. Um, you know, if you go to LinkedIn, I tend to put all my articles on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, and you know, come on, you're on the WhatsApp groups. I don't know if you want to share them with people. Uh, Telegram, you know, Telegram's much better because you can get like 50,000 people on a Telegram group. Um, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, just just reach out. I, um, I love connecting with people. Um, the only thing I don't do is if you send me an email, you might as well send me a smoke signal. <laughs> i will keep that in mind awesome thank you for your time today thank you for what you do for the world um and thank you for making all of these opportunities for people to um in invest i suppose as the rich and famous do um how they can do it for themselves even though they might not feel rich and famous yet and, no, rob, uh, rob, 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 two closing thoughts from my side because mm. i think it's really important people need to realize that the fundamentals of business and, and investing haven't changed technology is not a fix all and uh, they still need to be aware and, and, you know, it's really important that they understand that. If you invest with a bad partner and a bad project, you're still going to lose money. I don't care how much technology is involved. And secondly, you know, I encourage everyone to, to realize that there's a better way to invest now, not just with us, but using technology full stop. And um, I, th I believe it's all of our responsibility to go out there and educate and empower people so that we can make a dent in solving the greatest challenge on the planet, which is the wealth gap. And I, I encourage everyone to to not only test it for themselves, but share it with others because it's time to, to solve grand challenges. So well, you know, well done for you on sharing as well. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so there you have it, an outstanding interview with Scott Pickin, co-founder and CEO of Wealth Migrate and general future genius. 
I thoroughly enjoyed the time I got to spend with Scott and I've actually got to spend some time with him in person over the past few days. I hope you got out of it a huge amount and are going to go and put some things in place so that your future is one of your own design. As ever, this podcast is brought to you by the Tetri Key Business Revolutionary Club, where you can go and join us free of charge, no catch, no commitment, and no credit card to gain a huge amount of business, current, future, and up-to-date information and content for yourself on an ongoing basis. Links for membership and for everything else that Scott has gen- generously shared with us can be found below in the description. It's been a pleasure to serve you and I hope you have a revolutionary week.
So there you have it, the amazing Rick Wong. What a great series of insights, uh, information and thoughts with regards to what it is that you can do to copy the world's elites and possibly adopt the five abilities for yourself. I'd encourage you all to engage with Rick and lastly a massive thank you again to Rick for his time. Um, Certainly a conversation that I will be pursuing and I do hope we get to bring Rick back to be a guest for a second time on the podcast in the future. Please share this podcast on all of your social media platforms. In particular, take a screenshot and stick it on Instagram where you'll find us at underscore tetrachy. Lastly, this podcast is brought to you by the Tetrachy Business Revolutionary Club. We'd ask you to go join. It's free. Um, Go and check the link beneath. And we look forward to seeing you inside of the members area where we can continue to give you high quality, great information about how you can go and explode your business and do it in a way that most people will never, ever achieve the outcomes that you will. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to spending time with you in the next podcast. And um, if you have any further questions for Rick, please go and engage with him on LinkedIn, Facebook, or via his website. Stay amazing, stay revolutionary. It's been a pleasure to serve you.